Thank you very much. Please be seated. Uh, so our first speaker today really needs no introduction in this building, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce her anyway. Um, the Honorable Dr. Kathleen Hicks is the 35th Deputy Secretary of State, uh, or Deputy, Deputy Secretary of Defense. Oh my God. This is, this is going about as well as a jazz solo, sir. <laughs> um, she's held this position since February of 2021. She is the senior official overseeing the department's day-to-day -day operations and is responsible for the management of DOD's $800 billion plus budget against the Secretary's and the President's defense priorities. She was previously a senior vice president at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, and the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense for Strategy, Plans, and Forces in the Obama administration, and has held a number of senior positions within the department. It is a distinct privilege to welcome the Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Kathleen Hitz. Yeah. Right, good afternoon everyone, and thanks to everyone for joining today. It's really my honor to be here to reflect on Jim's decades of service to the Department of Defense and to wish him a well-deserved retirement. Before I begin, I do want to acknowledge Jim's family, his wife Elizabeth, his daughter Amanda, I'm not sure you want Amanda, she is over there, there she is, um, his son-in-law Jason and his grandson Elliot. I'm so glad that you were able to join us and it was a pleasure to spend some time with you just uh, before here. It's no secret that Jim thinks the world of all of you, and he is not alone. Over the years, many public servants and their families have been the direct beneficiaries of your family's generosity and kindness. You've been leaders in your own right, planning events and activities to help personnel living abroad, maintain connections with one another, and going above and beyond to make newcomers feel welcome. So I wanna thank you, Elizabeth, Amanda, Jason, Elliot for all that you are doing now and all that everyone but Elliot has been doing for years to support our national security mission. So in the legendary words of Ron Burgundy, Jim is a pretty big deal around here. His retirement represents a momentous occasion for the Defense Security Cooperation Agency and the many people who have worked with Jim both past and present including me. One of our military's greatest strategic advantages is our relationship with our allies and partners. DSCA and Jim's leadership have been critical in ensuring that our extensive network of allies and partners has what it needs as we work together to confront global security challenges and promote our shared values. I often say that leadership happens at every level because it's true. Jim's career is proof positive of that. Long before Jim came to DSCA, he started his career, as many public servants do, as a humble and earnest junior staff member, eager to learn and make a meaningful contribution to something bigger than himself. After several years in the Pentagon, Jim was offered a fellowship in the office of the Danish Minister of Defense in Copenhagen. The opportunity was quite impressive, and so was Jim, so much so that as a parting gift, the Danish minister awarded Jim a Royal Danish Army bayonet, a well-known symbol of the country's military power and tradition. Now, Jim, for many reasons, we cannot gift you a bayonet or anything <laughs> of that ilk, but I can assure you that we think just as highly of you, if not more so. Jim soon thereafter landed a role in the Defense Security Assistance Agency, DSCA's predecessor. Even though he was low on the proverbial totem pole back then, his passion for security cooperation was palpable, and he showed early on his potential to become a top-tier leader in the department. And as one could have easily predicted, over the past 30-plus years, Jim did, in fact, steadily rise to the department's highest ranks. Jim and my paths crossed for the first time about 25 years ago in the late 90s. That's right, the 90s. <laughs> At the time, he was the Nordic desk officer where he led on defense planning and strategy development. Jim made it his top priority to maintain strong, enduring relationships with our allies, especially newer allies who had joined NATO in the years following the end of the Cold War. Even then, Jim was clearly emerging as a well-respected and well-regarded professional, particularly as a go-to expert on security cooperation and security assistance. 
In the years that followed, he went on to hold a variety of senior leadership roles, including at two different defense agencies, the Defense Technology Security Administration and, of course, DSCA. Jim's deep-seated expertise and reliable, steady hand have been crucial in responding to a dynamic operating environment and a rapidly changing world. He was the acting Secretary of Defense representative in Europe and the acting defense advisor for the U.S. mission to NATO, including at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. As many of you know and experience, our national security mission never stops and the demands never slow. We simply adapt. So even under those unprecedented circumstances, Jim was persistent, key in convincing our NATO allies to spend more in support of their own defense and in defense of the alliance. And it's clear to us today how consequential his tireless work has been on that front. With such an illustrious career already under his belt, there was no better fit to lead DSCA at this time. Jim stepped into his role as director of DSCA in January 2022, only a few weeks before Russia's unlawful and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. In the more than 50 years of its existence, DSEA has transformed from a small agency to one with a staff of more than 1,000 skilled professionals capable of cooperating with more than 160 countries. Jim has been instrumental in advancing DSEA's mission, especially in the past two and a half years as he's led the execution of defense support to Ukraine, ensuring that it has the security assistance it needs to defend itself. Even given the demands of the past several years, Jim has remained as passionate about security cooperation and strengthening the United States relationship with its allies and partners as the day he started in care of his people, ensuring that his teammates' voices are heard, their work is supported, and their careers are as fulfilling as his has been. In fact, in his welcome message to the DSCA workforce, Jim stated that he was particularly excited about advancing the DSCA's Workforce Development Program, which provides training and career development opportunities to security cooperation professionals. When we sign up to serve in the Department of Defense, we commit to representing, protecting, and, and uh, serving Team USA. Many of us start these jobs at a young age when we believe we can push beyond the limits of time and capacity. And while we have the baton, we run as fast and as far as we can in advancing our national security mission. And that is what Jim Hirsch has done his entire career. At NATO, at DSCA, and stretching from one era of strategic competition to another. Jim's retirement represents the full circle of a focused and distinguished national security career. But it's come with a degree of sacrifice, nights and weekends away from family, holidays spent on travel, missing camping trips, all to ensure a safer, more secure world for all of us. Jim, please know that you have accomplished exactly that and you should be immensely proud of your career and contributions. And you can certainly count all of us here today among the long list of people around the world who are incredibly grateful for your leadership and for all you've done to support our allies and our partners and in defense of this nation. So congratulations to you and your family on your richly deserved retirement. It is my hope that you take advantage of the rest and respite that comes along with it. But rest assured that we will continue to build on your incredible work here. Thank you. Um, so Deputy Secretary Hicks is now going to present uh, Mr. Hirsch with the Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Award. This is the highest award that can be awarded to a civilian member of the Department of Defense. This is Mr. Hirsch's third time receiving the award from the department. The citation reads, Mr. James A. Hirsch is recognized for distinguished civilian service as Director, so Defense Security Cooperation Agency from January 2022 to July 2024. During his tenure, Mr. Hirsch oversaw implementation of numerous U.S. national security and foreign policy priorities, 
including the provision of billions of dollars of U.S. security assistance to Ukraine and Israel in the wake of Russia's invasion of February 24, 2022, and Hamas's attacks of October 7, 2023, respectively. Successive record-setting years of foreign military sales to allies and partners around the world, establishment of multiple financing options which opened new avenues of security cooperation with partners and successfully attrited defense markets from our strategic competitors, creation of the Defense Security Cooperation Service and overhaul of security cooperation workforce training programs to professionalize U.S. military and civilian officers operating at embassies abroad, and establish the process to institutionalize the continuous improvement of the U.S. foreign military sales system. Signed, Lloyd J. Austin III, Secretary of Defense, July 2024. Thank you, Madam De Deputy Secretary. Um, our next speaker uh, is the, Her Excellency Oksana Markarova, Ambassador of Ukraine to the United States. Ambassador Markarova was appointed to her position in February 2021 and is also Ukraine's permanent observer to the Organization of American States and Ambassador of Ukraine to Antigua and Barbuda since July 2023. Ambassador Markarova was previously Ukraine's Minister of Finance from 2018 to 2020, and prior to that spent almost 20 years working in private equity and finance. It is my great honor to bring Ambassador Markarova up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dear Director Harsh, dear Jim, it's such a big honor for me and my defense attaché, Major General Kremenetsky, to be here. Uh, with you, your family, with our friends from Pentagon to honor uh, everything we have done together and to say a big thank you. Um, as the director, you played a pivotal role, and it's not just a big word, but really a pivotal role in advancing U.S. defense and foreign policy interests uh, everywhere, making your country stronger through everything you and your team did, but also making a lot for the Ukraine's defense in the wake of in the in the uh, time when Russia again attacked us in 2022. Um, I have joined the embassy as uh, you heard in 2021 and of course the war was, was already in Ukraine but I didn't expect to be a wartime ambassador and I saw that cooperation with Pentagon and uh, the, the agency and all other agencies is going to be Boris's job of course you know and I will be just from time to time visiting nice ceremonies uh, but then but then, you know, in, uh, unfortunately, uh, in, in late 2021, when we all saw that attack is imminent, and we started working really hard in the first PDA package, and we see uh, Laura Cooper, our guardian angel here, was already approved uh, in December 2021. Uh, right after that, you joined as the director, and since then, there has been a lot of us in your life. <laughs> And not, not all the meetings have been easy, and some discussions have been very difficult. And of course, we cannot talk about any of them here, but I can only say that your unwavering commitment to the fight for freedom, your unwavering commitment to helping the friends in need, your unwavering commitment in understanding that we all have to win this war not only for the sake of Ukraine, for us it's existential, but for everyone who believe in these values. And we all have to win because we only can be strong together. So your commitment, your uh, tireless efforts, the work of your team, literally 24 seven together with Laura's team, uh, on everything that we needed at every particular time, helped us not only not to allow Putin to take Kiev in three days, not only to liberate already more than 50% of our territories, not only to literally liberate the Black Sea, but also helps us now to, to, to save so many Ukrainian lives, so many Ukrainian children. So with every capability that we're able to get together, it brings us closer to victory. And 
your personal participation and contribution to that is very great. And we will always remember and we will always value it. So today, as we honor your retirement, and frankly, we do think you are too young to retire, uh, <laughs> but we also celebrate the legacy that you leave behind the team that you have put together, your distinguished career marked by exceptional service and exemplary service to so many other public servants in this country, but also in Ukraine. Uh, but also your vision, your leadership, and always understanding what is at stake in this uh, horrible situation for all of us, again, for all democracies. So let me, on behalf of the people of Ukraine, on behalf of my president, uh, to say thank you to you for your exemplary service and your help to Ukraine, but also thank you to your family for all the sacrifices and for letting your member of the family actually stay apart from you for, for this very long two and a half years, almost two and a half, especially during this uh, aggression. Uh, please know that even though you will not be leading the agency, you always have place in Ukraine. You're always welcome in Ukraine. And we look forward to seeing you and spending time with you and doing something together in any new capacity that you would like. Or if you will decide just to focus on reading, there is a lot of that in Ukraine too. <laughs> and hopefully, hopefully, you know, we will soon be talking about more victories and then one big victory where just and last and peace will return to Ukraine and we can all think about how we can build as a future NATO member, as the future uh, reliable partner of the United States, a joint defense cooperation project which will make all of us stronger. So again, thank you very much. It's a big honor. And uh, together with Boris, if I may, <laughs> We would, like, we would like to give you something to remember Ukraine uh, as you will be reading or spending time with your grandson. Thank you, Madam Ambassador. Um, our next speaker is currently serving her second turn as Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, which I'm not sure is an honor or some kind of weird punishment. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ms. Amanda Dory is a career member of the Senior Executive Service and has served in numerous roles within OSD policy, including as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for African Affairs, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Strategy. She, has, uh, she is the DOD's Africa Center Director prior to her uh, coming as, as Acting USDP. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Acting Undersecretary of Defense for Policy, Ms. Amanda Dory. Thank you for not reading all of the previous positions. It gets horrible after a while, which I'm sure you appreciate. You know, if you've been around for a little while and you've held different positions and then there's a recitation, it's it's really unfortunate <laughs> to, to go through at length. But it's, it's really my privilege um, to address this distinguished group on the momentous occasion that brings us together today, which is honoring Jim Hirsch's service with the Department of Defense on the occasion of your retirement from the civil service. And before proceeding, I would just thank the ambassador, the deputy secretary of defense uh, for their remarks and, and their presence really illuminates what you mean um, within the department and into the broader group of allies and partners that the United States has around the world. And also to acknowledge Jim's family, uh, Elizabeth, um, the well-named Amanda, and <laughs> Jason, and lovely Elliot in, in the back. Um, so glad they're here with you today to help celebrate here in the Hall of Heroes. So I think as, as many of you have heard pieces and parts of, of Jim's pedigree, but uh, he has spent the majority of his career in um, policy and different aspects of policy, the, the uh, field agencies as well as uh, core policy. 
uh, but beginning in 1985 in the Office of Defense Planning and Program Guidance, which no longer exists. We have reorganized probably 15 times uh, since then, but those functions are always still there even, even though the names change. And then at various points um, in his career, he was special assistant to the ASD for international security affairs, deputy director of the Northern European Policy Office, deputy director of the Office of European Policy, uh, D Director of Defense Technology Security Administration, you know, massive field agency uh, overseen uh, in coordination with policy, and then the European assignments, the acting SECDEF representative in Europe, and defense advisor for the U.S. mission at NATO, among others. Um, but just such a, a storage career moving into different regional assignments and functional assignments. Um, in my view, a case of classic recidivism that we see <laughs> where in lengthy policy careers you um, are you serve as an action officer at one point and then you come back in the leadership position and then a senior leadership position and that's really what has happened um, most recently. Uh, you had the, the prior tour in Defense Security Assistance Agency, which is what it was when I first joined the department and, and met you. And now, of course, uh, Defense Security Cooperation Agency uh, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary. And so you have uh, been there for not 50 years, of course, but you have been there for <laughs> many, many years uh, and, and really at, at a time where uh, Defense Security Cooperation Agency is, is really having a record-breaking um, several years. And I, I think we heard a bit of that from, from the ambassador. But the statistics, the deputy mentioned 1,000 in, in DSCA, but it's really a workforce of 20,000 when you see all of the entities across the United States and in embassies around the world. So it is a, a massive enterprise um, that, that Jim is leading to ensure that the United States remains the global partner of choice in a very competitive environment. I think Secretary Austin's words are apropos when he said, I think we have all seen how crucial security cooperation is since Russia's unprovoked and unjust invasion of Ukraine, and as we've heard uh, from the ambassador as, as well. Your time as director of DSCA has been vital in aligning the agency to our national defense strategy, so this North Star that has really um, infused so much of the, the work that the department does and enhancing our ability to support allies and partners. As we've talked about earlier um, this week, the, the sales figures for DSCA this year, nearly a hundred billion dollars. <laughs> Just a phenomenal amount of um, activity and you know, kind of the, the leadership for that starts at the top and then extends, as the deputy said, uh, throughout the agency because you're seeing leadership at every level to have those types of, of results. So what a busy time for DSCA, what an important role, Jim, you've played in building relationships and strengthening alliances and partnerships. I'm sure those here in the room and those who are watching online as well would agree we are grateful to have had you as director with such an extensive expertise in security cooperation and a career-long commitment to this mission set both from the functional technical perspective, but also from the partner-centric and, and regional perspective, which really marries those two worlds together, uh, in particular working with the NATO allies across multiple different tours. One other dimension I'd like to mention, which hasn't come up uh, too much just yet, was just to appreciate your contribution as the dean of the career SES Corps in, in policy. Uh, and within the policy community. And we touched on this a little bit earlier this week at Jim's last large policy staff meeting, one of the, the highlights of everyone's week. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we, we had a standing ovation for, for Jim and then in the remarks as we went around the room, so many comments about mentorship and the way you have helped other leaders emerge um, with the strong model that you present and then the, the work that you have done to help bring future generations of leaders in, into policy. So um, you have passed the baton on now uh, in terms of that, that role as a dean, but it's really important to the policy career SES core, and so a special thank you in that regard. So 
Not only has Jim served his country for nearly four decades, um, but has done so with the highest degree of excellence. In that regard, you have earned two presidential rank awards, the highest award for SES uh, in the department, and then the, the three Secretary of Defense level awards for distinguished civilian service, including the one that is uh, paper clipped onto your uh, <laughs> jacket just now. So that, that one uh, really capping a, an extraordinary career. So, Jim, I know this year in particular has had some additional challenges that you have met with strength and, and resilience. Your work has tr contributed directly to the call to share in common challenges with U.S. partners and allies across the globe. Thank you for extending our strength and deepening our security. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your service to our great country. We will miss you. I will miss you. But please know that you carry our best wishes with you and Elizabeth as you head off into the next chapters ahead. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dory is also going to present Mr. Hirsch with his official retirement certificate from the Department of Defense. <laughs> um, the citation of this certificate reads, this certificate is presented to James A. Hirsch upon your retirement from the government of the United States of America following 38 years of loyal service. Signed Amanda J. Dory, Acting Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, <laughs> July 31st, 2024. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I now have the distinct honor and privilege of presenting uh, Mr. Jim Hirsch. I'm not going to introduce him because if you don't know who he is, why are you here? Uh, <laughs> Mr. Hirsch, congratulations, sir. All right, so if we're lucky, we'll both, we'll all make it through this uh, next section. Um, Sasha, thank you for being here. Amanda. Uh, Cara, Madeline, thank you all. Madam Ambassador, it means so much to have you here. And there's a lot of really good friends from a lot of different places uh, in the room and online. Uh, appreciate the uh, other members of the Security Cooperation Enterprise leadership being here. Uh, appreciate uh, folks from past experiences being here. And I uh, appreciate my friends from policy and from DSCA all being present. Um, the kind words that have been said mean a lot to me, and uh, as I said, it's uh, in many ways the people who I have known and worked with that have made this such a rewarding career. And so to all of you, uh, heartfelt thanks for being here today. Mentors, mentees, bosses, and coworkers, thanks to all of you. Special thanks to those at DSCA who have helped to make this happen, particularly Pam Brown back there in the back row, who's followed me in a couple of different places in my career, Jada Green, um, Dana Muscali, and Steve Derscheid, and to all of our military members who served as escorts today for those coming from the various entrances. I first walked into this building in 1985 as a young contractor fresh out of grad school. It was a very different place then. Before Penren, this was a rather dark and dreary building. Some days you might still say it's dreary, but it's no longer dark. <laughs> but you could feel the dedication of the people who worked in it. Casper Weinberger was Secretary of Defense, and Freddie Clay was the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. So think about how far back on the series of pictures in the USDP office <laughs> or the SecDef corridor that takes me. There were no computers, a few word processors, no email, and blessedly, the BlackBerry and iPhone were not yet dreamt of. <laughs> My first job was in the defense guidance staff charged with writing the midterm plan of the department, not unlike SPC today. When we needed to do a coordination on the document, I, as the newest member and youngest member of the office, would fill a cart with paper copies 
and walk to all the offices involved and drop those copies off. It sometimes took hours <laughs> and much shoe leather to just get the documents out for coordination. People would actually have to either call or physically come to the office to tell us if they concurred or not. So flash coordination meant something a little different. <laughs> People running down hallways to try to get something done by a deadline. So that was the height of the Cold War and the Reagan buildup, and I had the job of trying to determine the resource implications of the objectives in the plan over the five-year defense plan. Now, at that time, the five-year defense plan was a book that was this wide and this thick, and it was bound together, and you actually went and got it out of a safe, and you had to look at the very small numbers to figure it out. It was essentially an impossible task. <laughs> General Hooper may remember those days. <laughs> After doing that for a few years, I moved to NDU to write textbooks and do curriculum development for a non-resident course. And when that course was discontinued, I looked desperately for a next assignment, and I was hired into the Defense Security Assistance Agency, which was housed on the B-ring in the Pentagon in a bunch of cubicles. And then later, after I'd been there for a couple of years, we moved to Crystal City to where we are now. I had many responsibilities, but the most important ones were moving over $5 billion of excess equipment out of Europe after the Cold War ended. That was really quite something in the mid-90s. Karma was there with me all the way, working from State Department. Taking, we took the first F-16 and 18 programs into Central Europe, which was seen as a strong sign that they might get into NATO someday. And I worked one drawdown, the only one I remember, to help bring peace to the Balkans. This was the beginning of the rest of my career, a career in what I call defense diplomacy, understanding the importance of allies and friends. It was integrated deterrence ahead of its time. After five years, I took the next step to European policy as the Nordic desk officer. Now I was on the front lines of defense diplomacy, shaping relations, negotiating agreements, and already in 1996, encouraging Sweden and Finland to move as close to the alliance as they possibly could. For three years, I became an, after that, I became a Nordic in almost all ways, working as an exchange officer in the Danish MOD, including on 9-11, when I suddenly found myself with the Minister of Defense of Denmark standing next to me and promising solidarity no matter where it led us a promise the Danes kept despite the costs of doing so. I returned to the U.S. and served as the German desk in the lead up to the Iraq War, which was not a particularly easy time to be the German desk officer. Many folks in this building actually wanted to end that relationship. And then I went back to the Nordics. These were years of close interaction with secretaries of defense, traveling on the slave ship with the secretary. <laughs> making strong relationships on both sides of the Atlantic. So many of the friendships created in that time have lasted, and many of those folks are here today. Then one dark night, I was returning from a dinner with the Swedish MOD and Madeleine Morelmans, and I checked my Blackberry before I went in the house and discovered that I had been chosen for the senior executive service. It wasn't exactly how that was supposed to happen. <laughs> And it's also not something one can easily turn down. The next stage had begun, one in which life was as much about change management as about actions to do, but still one in which the responsibility for responsiveness and action was important. My first real assignment was to lead the Defense Technology Security Administration. DITSA was made up of dedicated, smart professionals who knew far more about the substance of their work than I did. I learned so much about them, the work, and about myself. I could feel myself growing and becoming committed to two key leadership beliefs. Everyone must be respected, and empowerment is far more important than micromanagement. With those as principles, it was possible to do actual culture change at DTSA. Having a fantastic deputy in Tony Aldwell, who may be watching online, helped a lot. With interagency partners, we pushed through the largest export control reform effort in recent history. We worked to ensure the edge for America's warfighters 
and we started a real effort to bring accountability and predictability to tech security processes, an action not yet complete. I traveled around the world, broadening my horizons beyond Europe, and again was overwhelmed by the dedication and professionalism of those I worked with. Someone once asked me if, I, if being the Deputy Defense Advisor at the U.S. Mission to NATO would interest me at all, and I replied that it was my dream job. It took some time to convince Jim Miller, who was supposed to be here today, but uh, unfortunately had to regret, to let me go, and it required a little help from Kath Hicks. And I never imagined it would end up being eight years in Belgium, but it was truly an experience I will always value. Shortly after I arrived, Russia illegally annexed Crimea, and the posting actually was very different than I expected. But I was in the right place at the right time to react to the initial Russian action, bring the alliance together, remind them of what deterrence and defense was all about, write and negotiate the original 2% pledge, and then proceed to support the innovative concept for deterrence and defense of the Atlantic area. I served as the acting SECDEF rep here twice in two very difficult presidential transitions. There were many other important things that we did while we were in Brussels, as well as a lot of beer and chocolate. <laughs> but I was lucky to have a great staff, including Jed Royal, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, good leadership at both the DFAD and ambassadorial levels, good allied colleagues, and good support in OSD, including Mark Jones. Finally, it was time to come home, and amazingly, the right job opened up at the right time. I returned to where my defense diplomacy roots began, DSCA. While I had anticipated staying a little longer at DSCA, I will always treasure this capstone experience. Little did I know that before I was in the job two months, my time there would be focused so much on one task. Supporting the Ukrainian people in their valiant fight against an illegal and inhumane invasion. The SCA moved over $50 billion in assistance to Ukraine. Madam Ambassador, it's an honor to have you here. Slava, Ukraine. Thank you. This experience supporting Ukraine has transformed the SCA. We are doing things one would never have imagined three years ago. Their responsiveness, the inventiveness, and the dedication of our staff is absolutely unbelievable. Amazing civil servants and military professionals. And there were other challenges. Within hours of the heinous attack on Israeli civilians on Saturday, the 7th of October last year, we were up and running to provide support, and we have not stopped. DSCA professionals worked at cost to physical health but still believed in their mission. Answering my question of concern about the morale with the only positive affirmation. Again, the deputy position has been extremely important in doing these things, and I have been blessed with the best. Jed Royal and Mike Miller. When my health became a concern, the entire organization reacted with huge moral support which provided so much strength in my battle. We have done and are doing great things, including overseeing an enterprise responding to incredible partner demand. People have mentioned the $100 billion this year so far. That's almost twice the year before. Continuous process improvement, changing the way we organize and train our people in embassies around the world, and the way we educate the security cooperation workforce. It's been a great career, surrounded by great colleagues who have become friends and the ability to see so much of the world. I leave you, though, with the two thoughts that have become so important to me. We must all respect all with whom we come in contact. We must be civil and make civility the norm. And being empowered and empowering is the most rewarding way to lead. So I have one last thing to do. One of the most difficult aspects of a career like this is being present in your personal life. 
1985, the phrase work-life balance did not exist. <laughs> My family has borne the brunt of the moves, the time away, and the time when I am home, but I have to be on the Blackberry, the iPhone, or the laptop. It hasn't been fair, but they've been with me all the way. So Elizabeth and Amanda, you have both given your lives to our country by supporting me in my choice to do so. I love you both so much. Jason, thanks for joining our family and for being there for us. And Elliot, so much ahead for you. It is in many ways for you and your contemporaries that what we have done matters. So I have some small tokens for Elizabeth and Amanda. So thank you, everyone. It's been a great ride. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for coming. That is the end of our formal program. Um, I would invite you to form a receiving line up at the front of the room for Mr. Hirsch. For those who are escorted through security, your escort officers will be in the hallway outside once you're ready to go. Thank you again for coming. <laughs>